morning. Welcome to the Boardwalk Fox program brought to you by the aquarium at the Dauphin Island Sea Lab. My name is Mendel Graber. I am one of the educators here at the Sea Lab and this morning we are going to be chatting with um, Joanne Moody who is one of the other educators here at the lab and we are going to chat about um, fog, about carnivorous plants, and also about some of the events coming up at the Sea Lab that um, you all can get involved in if you would like. So with that, I am going to um, turn this over to Joanne to tell us a little bit about Bob. Hey, hopefully everybody can hear me okay. Uh, like Mendel said, my name is Joanne and I teach here with Discovery Hall programs at the Dolphin Island Sea Lab. And so one of the uh, wetland habitats that we have conveniently right here on our campus is a pitcher plant bog. But I do want to tell you guys just a little bit about wetlands in general because we do have a number of them around the state of Alabama and maybe uh, where you live. So wetland habitats are wet environments. So one maybe of the, not always uh, wet, wetland but wet enough that it limits and kind of controls what plants and animals are living there. And so in a wetland, like maybe a swamp, uh, the, the plants that live there are uniquely adapted for living in an environment that is sometimes submerged in water. Um, so swamps are a great example of a wetland habitat. Another uh, wetland that we have here along our coast is a salt marsh. So if you've ever um, been down here along the coast or been involved in any of our programs, we love to take students out to our coastal salt marshes. Those wetland habitats are full of uh, coastal sea life, uh, birds, all sorts of things visiting that wetland habitat. But another kind of much more rare wetland habitat that we do have here in Alabama is a pitcher plant bog. And so pitcher plant bogs can be found along our coastal plain here in the southeastern part of the United States. So if you visit Mississippi, Alabama, um, and into Florida and Georgia, you can find pitcher plant bog habitats. So they're often, at least in this part of the country, associated with longleaf pine forests. And around here, they're typically uh, caused by the draining of water from these longleaf pine habitats. And so when you visit a pitcher plant bog, it's not going to appear as a what you would think of a wetland. You're not going to see standing water. It's going to appear dry. But I've been to quite a few of these pitcher plant bogs in our area. And the minute you kind of take a step into these bogs, it's very gushy. Um, it can be uh, quite, uh, you know, it makes a lot of noise sometimes because there will be water kind of gurgling up. Um, from below the surface. Uh, and so that water may be draining down a hillside, draining from that longleaf forest um, and creating this wetland habitat. So a couple of things that are unique to bogs um, and specifically these pitcher plant bogs is, is that water, but then also the pH is rather low. So much lower than you would find probably in your yard or in a garden or in um, you know soil use for farming. So it would be around a five um, pH, so that's pretty acidic, but these plants are adapted for growing in that low pH environment. Also, um, they lack nutrients, or at least the nutrients are not available to the plants. And that has uh, led to this kind of incredible adaptation that these plants have to be carnivorous meaning that they do eat insects. Um, so characteristic of these bogs are these pitcher plants, like I, I've mentioned. And we do have a couple of different species in our bog here. They're not um, uh, living right now. They have uh, gone dormant for from last year. But here in just a few weeks, we should start to see a little bit of new growth. Um, How's that? 
Yeah, so as um, Angela kind of moves the camera around and Mendel, that is actually a flower from last year uh, from one of our pitchers. So we have two main uh, pitcher plant types in this bog here, two main species, um, the white tuft and the pale pitcher. Um, and so that bloom, uh, it, the blooms of pitcher plants look quite odd um, because the flower is kind of turned upside down and they have this kind of oversized style structure um, that forms a cap. That cap serves uh, an important function though. So the flower of the pitcher plant um, attracts bees and other insects in to um, the flower and they're actually using that cup to crawl along to get to the nectar but as they do that they pick up pollen they pick up pollen on their feet from where it's fallen onto that cap and they pick up pollen on their back and so then as they move from flower to flower they're helping to pollinate um, these plants here the flowers themselves have an odor a smell that attracts those pollinators um, I've I've read that it is not a pleasant odor. Um, I've, I've read some things that compare it to cat urine. So I'm not sure why that's attractive to, to bees and other pollinators, but it is. Um, but then the other, like I said, these are carnivorous plants. They're not eating the pollinators. What they're eating are other insects that are attracted to the smell and uh, the look of the pitcher plant itself. So a pitcher plant um, has that name because it does have this long tube structure that kind of looks like a water pitcher. Sorry, I just had my hand over the microphone there. Um, and they're very brilliantly colored and so would be attractive to an insect. And they come right to the edge um, or what's known as the peristome of that pitcher. And that, and, and you may be able to see it in that picture, it's really smooth and kind of slippery. And so those insects um, will get onto that lip and kind of fall into the pitcher. And then they fall down into the base of the tube and are digested. There are enzymes and bacteria in a fluid down in the base of that pitcher. And that works right away at digesting those insects that kind of perilously fall into um, the pitcher. So it works a lot like our mouths. We have enzymes and bacteria in our mouths that right away start digesting the food that we eat. Um, so it kind of works in that way. Um, one of the interesting things, if we walk around this way, um, there is another insect association that I wanted to mention. Um, so there is a symbiotic relationship between pitcher plants and a small moth called a xyra or often just referred to as a pitcher plant moth and they actually live inside of the pitchers and they can complete their entire life cycle in the pitchers their um, larvae grow up inside the pitcher plant and if you look right here at this pitcher that hole is probably the exit hole from one of those exira moth larvae. So they chew right through um, the pitcher. So sometimes you'll, you'll visit a pitcher plant bog and the pitchers will be kind of bent over and that's from damage from those exira moths. Another animal that you'll sometimes find in these pitchers and we often find them are small frogs. And I think Mendel was looking just a moment ago to see if we had any, I thought I saw, oh, sorry. I thought I saw one earlier, but of course it's quite cold here, even in South Alabama. Um, I, I think Mendel said it was still in the forties. Um, so it's a little <laughs> bit cold for us. It's a little cold. bit chilly. Um, but so in addition to uh, the pitcher plants, there are actually a number of other carnivorous plants that live in a pitcher plant bog. Again, everything's kind of dormant for the most part now, um, but bladder worts, um, sundews are a fun one. Sundews have little sticky uh, threads, hairs 
that attract insects. Um, yeah, I think I have a picture there. And um, so those little so, and you mentioned the role of fire yes. in the bog. And so do you want to yeah. explain that with uh, yeah, so, reference to the dormancy? Right. So ordinarily, this time of year is when um, uh, we would burn a bog. So a fire-dependent habitat, meaning that um, the, the pitchers themselves, they rely on a lot of sunlight to grow. Um, and could easily be shaded out by shrubs and, and trees. And so longleaf forests, like they're associated with, are susceptible to natural fires from lightning strikes. Um, and so before there was human development, fires would naturally uh, sweep through these habitats keep out those woody shrubs and small trees and allow the plants, um, the pitcher plants to grow. So um, this bog itself, I was hoping we could do a burn today, but you can see it's quite windy. Um, so we're not going to be able to burn. And I think I would probably get in trouble if I um, caught our classroom on fire here. Um, and one of the problems, um, both in our little bog here and in bogs in our area, is this invasive grass called Kogan grass. And you can see um, all of this brown, very dry, you guys can probably hear that very crunchy dry material. This would make for a, a raging fire. Um, and that's actually something that happened here on um, Dauphin Island a number of years ago in our forest. There was a fire and this Kogan grass, this invasive grass um, just led to a really destructive fire. So it's important that we remove this. So uh, probably when this boardwalk talk is over, I'm going to have to come through and physically remove all of this material um, because it probably wouldn't be safe for me to burn it. Um, but burn would keep out some of these uh, weedier, hardier shrubs um, and allow for more pitcher plant growth and more diversity in general. Pitcher plant bogs, um, and, and these kind of um, edge habitats that they're associated with the um, Longley Forest are incredibly biodiverse. Meaning there are lots and lots of different species. If you visit the um, Splinter Hill Bog up in, it's just north of Mobile in Baldwin County, they've documented over 60 species of plants up there. So that's really incredible diversity. This um, coving grass gets tall too, so yes. it has the potential to shade out. Absolutely, the, it's uh, definitely and and definitely shading out a lot of the other plants that live here. So the sundews, but also club moss, um, the milk wor uh, milk roots, candy roots, um, all of those that would be growing much closer down to the soil here. All of this is shading that out. So I have got a lot of work to do in this bog to allow um, these plants to really thrive. One that's really kind of growing out of control but is found naturally in these bog habitat, habitats is St. John's wort. Um, and, and I've said wort a number of times. That term wort, it's a very old word and is associated with plants that have, hold some medicinal value. Um, and, and so St. John's wort is used so Joanne what I think is yeah. interesting is this is a very small um, educational tool that yeah. you have here on campus as educators that you use because bringing students out to a bog yes. would be quite a trek in order to do that right so in speaking to the educational tools that you bring to the students mm -hmm. when we talk about Discovery Hall programs and our education that we share which we're celebrating 50 years of this yes. year what are some other programs that you're able to kind of give students this realistic look at what our environment is? Yes, um, so, you know, a lot of what we would ordinarily be doing is bringing students out into the various habitats around Dalton Island, um, the wetlands like the St. Marsh here. So we um, would ordinarily be very busy with those programs. But now um, we are kind of adjusting things a little bit. And, you know, to what you're speaking of, I, I did want to mention we're, we're providing a lot of resources for teachers on the web. 
Um, and one of the things that I've made um, to go along with this picture plant blog is some educational signage. And this is going to be shared as a resource on our website um, and, and some additional information related to pitcher plant bogs, um, maybe a little activity, um, a little lesson to go along with it. Um, but so this is a, a mock-up of a sign that will be installed here um, for the school groups that visit um, to learn a little bit more about that bog habitat. But yes, we have, um, you know, field classes that we, we continue to offer, um, certainly making accommodations um, for the times that we're in now, but we have a number of programs coming up. Um, we have programs running this Friday and Saturday that um, people can still sign up for. So these are not um, school programs, but for anybody that's interested, they're certainly educational programs. Um, but if you know you want to sign your child up, you want to share that information with your students. I know um, we're doing a, a plankton activity on Friday. There is a trip to the salt marsh plant. Um, I think it's supposed to be warmer on Friday. I'm not sure. Um, but then also Saturday, I know we have some programs running. I think uh, Mendel has a, a trip going out on a vessel. And then um, if you are interested in doing something with your family with us, getting out in the environment, um, we have family camp programs that are overnight, staying in our dorms, um, doing programs with us coming up in both February and March. Um, so they're weekend programs. You would stay Friday to Sunday. Um, and those are a lot of fun. We're gonna go kayaking and go, go out on our research vessel. Um, that, that sort of thing. We have a lot of those coming up. And Mendel, when we talk about the aquarium and the programs that the aquarium offers, we're still, we're open seven days a week. We are open. Um, and we do have on Friday afternoon, we have a vessel excursion, um, where we will go out into Mobile Bay, um, possibly south of the island into the Gulf, uh, and Troll. And, um, so that's open to the public and you can find information about that on our website, www.disl for Dolphin Island Sea Lab .edu. Um, so if you are interested in joining us here at the lab to learn more about some of our uh, coastal ecosystems and to immerse yourselves in the experience out in the field or uh, visit the aquarium where you can see those ecosystems represented indoors, uh, please do join us. You can learn more on our, on our website. Um, Joanne, yeah. uh, I thought because, uh, because it's here, <laughs> Not that we'd like to see it here, but just oh. because it's an opportunity, definitely you might point out this uh, aphid. Well, and um, so this is a fire ant mound that we've been trying to avoid. One of us uh, disturbed it, but those fire ants, another invasive that we have that actually um, was introduced in the United States via the portamobile. Um, and I'll try to keep my shadow out of it. But I'm, I'm glad you mentioned it just because um, those of you that may be local that are tuning in, for anybody that saw the mural um, that was installed downtown of E.O. Wilson, e. o. Wilson um, Alabama naturalist, native, um, you know, champion of, of the environment. Um, so they just installed the mural and it's a, it's a really neat um, image with, with an ant. Um. So as a boy, he discovered this uh, invasive species uh, and documented it yeah. in Mobile. And, and then uh, after that, he became an entomologist, someone who studies insects, studied a lot of other kinds of ants in a lot of other parts of the world. But this, this ant, as this ant species, as Joanne mentioned, is invasive. And uh, invasive species are those that are not, that have not evolved into a particular ecosystem and they create problems in the ecosystem into which they are introduced. And so these ants are very uh, aggressive towards other arthropods, other insects, uh, and they can even cause problems for 
birds, particularly ground nesting birds, and even in some places where there's a high density of these fire ant mounds and the ants, uh, even in pasture land, they can cause problems for livestock. So um, very aggressive ant species, and they have a they have a painful um, bite. So you don't want to uh, you know I, I stepped on it to disturb it to show you the ants moving, um, but if you step on an ant mound, you definitely want to step away from it so that they don't um, so they don't eat you. Yeah. Um, I did go ahead and grab one of the uh, dead pitchers just to show you guys. This is actually, I, I think, I, I'm not positive, but it looks like a capsule, like what the moth larvae may have developed inside. Um, but that's just a guess. But ordinarily, um, we break these open to find the exoskeletons of the insects that they have digested. Um, but but like I said, this is kind of a capsule thing created by leaves. So I think um, that was an intentional effort <laughs> by, by some animal um, to make that capsule inside that pitcher. So that's kind of neat. Another thing I was going to point out, you mentioned that uh, the bogs are fire-adapted landscapes. Yeah. So these plants have um, evolved into this system. <laughs> Uh, wherein they thrive with these frequent fires. Yes, and so, so go ahead. Um, I mean, you can add to this, but one of the things that I was going to point out is that some of the seeds of plants in um, fire adapted landscapes, they don't sprout until after a fire. Right. So those plants, the seeds will be dormant mm -hmm. until there is a fire and then sprout because the fire uh, as Joanne mentioned, will lower the uh, whatever may be growing above the ground that would shade out these new, newly sprouted seeds. Um, and so it, that makes more nutrients, more sunlight available to these new sprouts. So there is an advantage to, um, you know, to using fire as a, uh, as a trigger. Mm -hmm to sprout. I think what's cool is when we talk about marine science, you think mainly about animals, but it's important to understand the habitats that these animals are a part of as well, because it all works together. Yep, they are connected. So this is a, you know, this is a, an ecosystem that historically was much more common along the Gulf Coast. And um, as Joanne pointed out, as we started a program of fire suppression, as humans um, settled the Gulf Coast, we kind of changed this landscape. Um, so as the fires were put out, it allowed the, those taller shrubs to gain hold, to mature, and to, you know, to shade out these, um, bog plants and it, it really caused significant changes in the uh in the coastal ecosystems these pine savannas absolutely and scientists actually estimate that about 98 percent of all um pitcher plant bog habitat has been lost in in the united states um so that's that's a tremendous amount there are um some reserves that you can visit where pretty extensive um, bog habitat still uh, remains. So I mentioned the Splinter Hill bog. There's um, a pitcher plant bog over at Weeks Bay National Estuarine Research Reserve. Um, there's one here locally in Mobile at the Environmental Study Center that's part of Mobile County Public School System. Um, but if you visit in Mississippi, there's the um, Sandal Crane Wildlife Refuge that has a pitcher plant bog. But so much of it has been eliminated, like Mendel said, either through fire suppression um, just developing the land for other purposes. Um, a lot of um, impacts from uh, drainage, uh, you know, um, I can't think of the word, but um, changing, you know, drainage. Um, and so a lot, of, a lot of that habitat has been lost. Most of these um, 
pitcher plant species and carnivorous species are protected at some level. Um, there's a black market for pitcher plant um, pitcher plants of various species. Um, so people will go out and harvest whole plants to grow them, or um, cutting the um, the pitchers to use for ornamental, you know, decorations. Um, they do, you, you mentioned seeds, they do re reproduce by seed, but they also grow by rhizome. So that underground kind of horizontal root system. Um, and so, you know, going in and, and chopping them out, um, you know, entire clusters that can cause a lot of damage. Um, so definitely, you know, a habitat that is at risk of being lost um, if we don't uh, step in to preserve it, for sure. So Angela mentioned the connection. Actually, I am. Yeah. Um, and so this is a coastal ecosystem. It is not necessarily uh, the one that you would find closest to the ocean. Um, but, uh, you know, bogs serve, wetlands in general serve as nursery habitats. So they provide sheltered habitat for a lot of uh, animals when they are babies. And the, um, I would say the major connection, if you're looking for a connection between pit, the, our coastal pitcher plant bogs and the ocean would be the water. So the water flow. So um, wetlands also serve as filters. So water will stand in these ecosystems, um, as Joanne mentioned, but it also moves through them. It moves through them slowly. Um, and with that water moving slowly through them, there is an animal that I'll mention um, that is found surprising to most people, um, the crayfish. So you may think of a crayfish, crawfish, crawdad, um, as being uh, an animal that's found in a swamp or a stream, creek, something like that. Um, but there is enough water in pitcher plant bogs to support crayfish. So they will tunnel down um, and actually form little towers that you may be able to identify if you visit a pitcher plant bog. And some of these species, so we use that term invasive, um, some of these crayfish species are endemic, meaning they're only found in one particular area. Um, so some of these species are found nowhere else on the planet except for the pitcher plant bogs of Mississippi and Alabama. Um, so I encourage you to, to go and visit one of these uh, pitcher plant bog habitats and uh, find, find a crayfish, or at least the evidence of them with their little mud towers. Um, they're pretty cute, but definitely a, a sign that there's water there. It's just kind of locked in under the ground. about these habitats as, as being here locally and remembering that we have these kind of treasured habitats uh, in our own backyard and these are places that you can get out and visit with your family um, that are uh, you know easily accessible um, and just to, to get out and enjoy um, nature and kind of these incredible displays uh, of, of biodiversity and um, I, I think they're really incredible places. Um, so I would encourage you to, to get out with your families and, and go visit them. All right, well, thank you, Joanne, yeah. for joining us this morning and chatting with us. And thank you for joining us. Um, and we do have these boardwalk talks on first and third Wednesdays of the month.